Matthew chapter 5. I'm continuing my studies through the Sermon on the Mount. And we finished looking at Matthew 5, 17 through 20. Last week, I taught four sermons on Matthew 5, 17 through 20. So I guess you could say I gave each verse a sermon. I never know how many sermons. It's not like I say, all right, I'm going to teach 10 sermons on this text. I just go as I'm able, and we hit all of the verses, and hopefully they stick with us. And today, we're going off of the heels of Matthew 5, 17 through 20, and we're going to read Matthew 5, 21 through 26. This is our Messiah speaking. I'm reading out of the World English Bible. You have heard that it was said to the ancient ones, You shall not murder, and whoever murders will be in danger of the judgment. But I tell you that everyone who is angry with his brother without a cause will be in danger of the judgment. And whoever says to his brother, Raka, will be in danger of the council. And whoever says, You fool, will be in danger of the fire of Gehenna. If therefore you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has anything against you, leave your gift there before the altar, and go your way. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. Agree with your adversary quickly, while you are with him on the way, lest perhaps the prosecutor deliver you to the judge, and the judge deliver you to the officer and you be cast into prison. Most certainly, I tell you, you shall by no means get out of there until you have paid the last penny. Matthew 5, 21 through 26. I'd like to read the same section in the contemporary English version. Once again, the CEV, Matthew 5, 21. You know that our ancestors were told, do not murder, and a murderer must be brought to trial. But I promise you that if you are angry with someone, you will have to stand trial. If you call someone a fool, you will be taken to court. And if you say that someone is worthless, you will be in danger of the fires of hell. So if you are about to place your gift on the altar and remember that someone is angry with you, leave your gift there in front of the altar and make peace with that person and then come back and offer your gift to Yahweh. Before you are dragged into court, make friends with the person who has accused you of doing wrong. If you don't, you will be handed over to the judge and then to the officer who will put you in jail. I promise you that you will not get out until you have paid the last cent you owe. May Yahweh bless His word to our hearts today. Today we're going to learn that Yeshua taught us that the sixth commandment, do not murder, the Sixth Commandment, or Thou Shalt Not Murder, in KJV, is not just about the actual or the intentional taking of a life, but it's also about hatred, slurs, bitterness, unforgiveness, and even shooting somebody a bird in traffic. We've all got a lot to work on, don't we? <laughs> we'll begin at verse 21 where Yeshua begins by saying, You have heard that it was said to the ancient ones. You've got to realize that you have heard that it was said is different from it is written. There are times when Yeshua quotes Scripture and He says, It is written, and He gives you the quotation. There are other times, though, where He says, You have heard that it was said. But you have heard that it was said means an interpretation of a quotation of Scripture. Here he says, you have heard that it was said to the ancient ones. And he's probably going back to the beginning of Second Temple period times. When the Scriptures would be read in Hebrew under the days of Ezra the priest, who was a righteous man, and he was well taught in the law, and he established in his heart to teach Yahweh's law and statutes to the Hebrew people. And he would read the Scriptures in Hebrew, and then he would give the sense of the Scriptures in Aramaic, the language that a lot of people, for the majority of the time there, would speak. 
So he would quote a verse, and then he would give a commentary. Uh, a lot of times this is called a targum, Aramaic targum. Uh, you can still read the Aramaic targums of the scriptures. They are a lot more paraphrased than an actual translation. So you've heard that it was said is a scripture and an interpretation of that scripture. Yeshua uses both of these. In Matthew chapter 4, when Yeshua is facing off with Satan or the devil, what does he say each time? It is written. And he quotes all three times. He quotes from the book of Deuteronomy. So here in Matthew chapter 5, he says, you've heard that it was said to the ancient ones. He doesn't say it is written, but then he says, you shall not murder. And whoever murders will be in danger of the judgment. These are two things that the scripture says. And automatically we think, how can a scripture just be quoted by itself, all by itself, but be misinterpreted? How can you misinterpret a scripture if you just quote it by itself? The way that that can be done is with the intention of the individual or the person that is making the quotation. An example of this is in Yeshua's face off with the devil, again in Matthew chapter 4, where the devil himself quotes from Psalm chapter, I believe it's Psalm chapter 91. The devil says, it is written, and of course he goes on to talk about how he shall give his angels charge over thee, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against the stone. And then Yeshua, obviously, he claps back with, it is also written, and he quotes from Deuteronomy. So Scripture can be quoted by itself. Even the devil can quote Scripture. Never be seduced by any so-called preacher or prophet just because they can quote Scripture or quote a lot of Scripture. Anybody can quote Scripture, including the devil. It is quite another thing for somebody to actually live or behave as the Scripture says. So it's important that we realize that Yeshua here is contrasting his correct interpretation with either the wrong interpretation of the scribes and Pharisees or the lacking interpretation of the scribes and Pharisees. Yeshua is not taking away from the old law here. Yeshua is not adding new law here. He is rather giving us the full intention of the law of Moses. This is not Yeshua versus prophet Moses. Okay, they're on the same team. This is Yeshua versus the Hebrew leaders, or at least some of the Hebrew leaders of His day. The hypocrites. The ones who went by the letter only, like I talked about last week. And He calls them in Matthew 5 verse 20, the scribes and Pharisees. And remember what He said. He said, unless your righteousness surpasses the scribes and the Pharisees, you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. I talked about how that, that is talking about we must have the letter and the spirit of the law and not just the letter of the law. Just the letter of the law is lacking. So this is what Yeshua is doing. Not taking away from the old. Not adding the new. He's telling you this is how the scribes and the Pharisees understand this scripture. But it's either wrong or it lacks. Now I say unto you, I'm going to tell you the proper understanding of this particular scripture. And then he quotes from the scriptures. You shall not murder and whoever murders will be in danger of the judgment. Is what is being said and heard true? Yes. The Scripture says you shall not murder, and the Scripture says whoever murders, or it teaches at least, whoever murders will be in danger of the judgment. Murder is wrong. Many verses teach not to murder, and teach also that the punishment, the civil law, the punishment for murder, is death. Genesis 9 verse 6 Exodus 21, 12 through 14, and Numbers 35, if anybody wants to look those up in their own study time. So the law teaches against murder, and if someone commits murder, the law teaches that they are to be put to death, provided that there are two or more witnesses to the murder. So what's the problem here? What is the problem with people just quoting from the Scriptures? Well, the problem is this, is that many of the scribes and Pharisees limited the commandment and the judgment to just the letter of the law, to just the physical taking of a life with malicious intent. The intention of the law or the spirit of the law is deeper than just the physical act of murder. I told somebody one time, 
Even an unbeliever a lot of times can obey the letter of the law. An unbeliever can not murder or not steal simply out of fear that they'll get caught and thrown into prison. But it takes someone that is born from above or born of the Spirit to obey not just the letter of the law, but also the Spirit of the law. Well, what is the Spirit of the law? Well, some of the things that I talked about at the beginning of the sermon. Things like um, hatred or outbursts of anger or uh, obscene gestures or uh, calling people a fool or a moron or an empty head. All of these violate the spirit of the sixth commandment. Do not murder. So what was overlooked here in this case by the scribes and Pharisees? Well, Yeshua begins to go into a deeper explanation of this law in Matthew 5, 21 through 22. Notice he begins in verse 22, But I tell you, and that's in opposition to you have heard that it had been said to the ancient ones, this, but I tell you this, that everyone who is angry with his brother without a cause will be in danger of the judgment. And whoever says to his brother, Raka, will be in danger of the council. And whoever says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of Gehenna. So, the scribes and the Pharisees did not go around committing actual physical murder. But, they did do the things that Yeshua listed here in the next verse. And that's why he's contrasting this understanding with their understanding which is lacking. Where does murder begin? Murder always begins in one's thoughts. The same place righteousness begins. Where does righteousness begin? When you want to be righteous, it always begins in your thoughts. And then eventually it comes out in your actions. And Yeshua is teaching us that the thoughts that we have against our neighbor fall under the Sixth Commandment. The Sixth Commandment also entails not bringing any harm to anybody or saving a life or taking care of people or being kind and being nice and being generous to people. The Sixth Commandment is not just about the negative, but to every negative there is a positive. Each one of the commandments that say thou shalt not, there is a thou shalt on the opposite end of the spectrum of that particular commandment. So do not murder means preserve life. Uh, do not commit adultery means love your spouse. Uh, do not steal means give generously. See, So there's positives to every negative commandment. Each day as we interact with people, we are either violating the spirit of the sixth commandment or we are walking in the spirit of the sixth commandment. I thought about this in relation to how I have to sometimes interact with not so good people. And I'll just say it, not so friendly customers. Sometimes I have to interact with people like that. And sometimes it's difficult because, especially in the summertime, because you're hot and you're sweaty and you're tired and you don't work for six or seven hours and it's the last job of the day and somebody wants to have an attitude. And so then we really see, <laughs> am I going to walk in the Spirit or am I going to walk in the flesh? <laughs> am I the only one that deals with that? I don't think so. How we interact with people on a daily basis, every day that we wake up, we have the opportunity to fulfill the sixth commandment. Not just by physically not murdering someone, but also by the way that we interact with the people that we meet. Are we bringing life? Are we bringing health? Are we bringing a wealth of wisdom and knowledge and understanding to the people that we meet? Or are we walking around with this big chip on our shoulder ready to explode on somebody or go off on somebody that speaks to us the wrong way? I told y'all a few sermons ago how that we were in traffic not too long ago and I just barely was pulling out of a gas station and I had looked one way and I thought I had looked the other way but evidently there was a car that was coming across the street and really wasn't a close call at all. But... I slammed on the brakes, didn't really get my nose out into the road that good, and all of a sudden this person sees me, they lay on the horn, and up goes two birds, right? <laughs> the hand gesture birds, right? I'm not talking about the robins or the sparrows, but the hand gesture birds. And immediately, my flesh wants to act back in kind. But the Holy Spirit 
of Yahweh overtook me in that situation. And I just looked. And then I just looked away. And then I just obeyed the traffic law and let everything be kosher. Now, I could have stopped, put the air brake on, got out, raised my hands and everything, and that would not have done any good. It would not have shown the spirit of the Messiah, and it may have caused more problems than had happened at that time. Praise Yahweh for the Holy Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit. That wasn't the fruit of Matthew. That was the fruit of the Spirit. And I'm thankful that Yahweh's Spirit dwells within me. We're talking about the Sixth Commandment. It's more than, not, it's more than just not murdering. It has to do with the intentions of the heart. So, verse 22 says, But I tell you that everyone who is angry with his brother without a cause will be in danger of the judgment. The earliest manuscripts of the Gospel of Matthew actually don't contain that phrase, angry without a cause. It just says whoever is angry with his brother. I think the overall understanding of Scripture, though, teaches angry without a cause. Um, that doesn't give us license. <laughs> I'm not giving anybody license to go out and say, well, I've got a cause, bless God, so I'm going to be angry. No, that's, that's not the right attitude to have. That's bitterness, okay? Angry without a cause, the understanding is, is there are some things that cause us to be angry, and there is such a thing as righteous anger, okay? Um, Mark chapter 3. Let me turn over, or I'll just pull it up on the screen here. Mark chapter 3. I believe it is, beginning at verse 1. It says, The next time that Yeshua went into the meeting place, a man with a crippled hand was there. The Pharisees wanted to accuse Yeshua of doing something wrong, and they kept watching to see if Yeshua would heal him on the Sabbath. Yeshua told the man to stand up where everyone could see him, and then he asked, On the Sabbath, should we do good deeds or evil deeds? Should we save someone's life or destroy it? But nobody said a word. Look at verse 5. Yeshua was angry as he looked around at the people. Yet he felt sorry for them because they were so stubborn. And he told the man, stretch out your hand. He did, and his bad hand was healed. The Pharisees left, and right away they started making plans with Herod's followers to kill Yeshua. So here we see that Yeshua, who we know was sinless, he never transgressed Yahweh's law, here he was angry. He felt sorry for them on one hand because of their stubbornness, but yet he was angry with them because they were so rigid in the letter that they forgot the spirit. In this case, the letter of the Sabbath, they were so rigid in, they forgot the spirit of the Sabbath. Now, obviously, the spirit of the Sabbath, there's nothing in the Sabbath commandment that would forbid us from doing good, saving life, helping people on the Sabbath day. So it's wrong for us to refrain from that. I talked about that a little bit last week. So, I do think that without a cause here in verse 22 has merit based on the overall context of Scripture. And the majority text of the New Testament does read without a cause. It's just that the earliest manuscripts omit that phrase. He says, whoever is angry with his brother without a cause will be in danger of the judgment. Uh, commentators differ on what the judgment means here. They say, some of them, that this could be the local court that consisted of about seven elders versus the primary court, the Sanhedrin, which is next, that consisted of around 70 elders. However, I think probably my take on this is in danger of the judgment is a reference to the final judgment from Yahweh. I think if we walk around with anger in our hearts towards people, it's a fruit of a stony heart. It's a fruit that the Spirit has not affected us as people. Now that doesn't mean that a Christian, a believer, can't get angry in the wrong way. We can be angry in the wrong way and then when we realize it, what do we do? We ask for Yahweh's forgiveness and we repent and we say, Yahweh help me by your spirit not to do that anymore. But I'm talking about someone who is habitually, unrepentantly just angry and angry at everything and everybody. I think that's evidence that there could be danger for you at the judgment. And then he says, and whoever says to his brother Raka will be in danger of the council. And that word council is the word Sanhedrin. Sanhedrin, the court, primary court in Jerusalem, Israel of 70 elders that you were brought before in case you were about to have to pay some kind of big fine or big penalty. You've done something really wrong. The word Raka 
means airhead, empty, nothing, moron, basically an angry slur. You get upset at someone, you get in the heat of the moment, and you call them a bad word. And a bad word, let me say this, this needs to be said, a bad word doesn't just mean a four-letter word. People have cursing all wrong. The sin of cursing is when you intend to harm someone with your words. And it's no different if you say raka, moron, fool, stupid. If you say it in the wrong spirit, they all mean the same thing. You're trying to put down somebody in the heat of the moment. I remember one time I was a teenager and I got into an argument with a good friend of mine and I said something that I should not have said and immediately I was like what in the world are you doing and I got out of the car and I was man I was so upset and we had both said things that we shouldn't have said and instead of walking away or trying to walk home, or, or trying to page somebody, or beep somebody from a pay phone for a ride. I walked around to the car and I said, man, come here. And he said, no, 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 no. I said, man, come here. And I grabbed him and I hugged him. And I said, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have said that. And it broke. That's right. And he said, I'm sorry too. That's making amends with folks. Amen. I made a mistake and I sinned in my anger with what I said towards that person. But I wanted to make it better because it didn't feel right. You know why it didn't feel right? It grieved the Holy Spirit of Yahweh that's inside of me. If we can do those type of things and not feel grief, it might be that we don't have the Holy Spirit. He then says at the end, and whoever says you fool will be in danger of the fire of Gehenna. Um, I'll deal with the fire of Gehenna in another sermon. I think I will take a whole sermon to talk about what that actually means. In a nutshell, it's talking about the eternal punishment of the wicked, um, the lake of fire, we might call it, or the second death. But I want to center in on the word fool here because contextually, what Yeshua is saying is when you, in your anger, lash out at someone and say, you are a fool, or you big stupid fool, what Yeshua is saying is you're making a moral judgment on the eternal destiny of that individual. In Scripture, many times in Scripture, and I'm going to show you this from the Psalms, a fool... Like Psalm 14 verse 1 says, The fool hath said in his heart, There is no God. And people use that verse in combat to atheism. Now obviously I'm against atheism. I believe in a creator, right? But atheism as we define it today is not the exact same thing as it was defined when the psalmist wrote, The fool hath said in his heart, There is no God. Let's look at it in Psalm 14. Let's go to a more literal translation. World English Bible. Psalm 14 verse 1, The fool has said in his heart, There is no God. Notice what's said next. They are corrupt. They have done abominable deeds. There is no one who does good. Yahweh looked down from heaven on the children of men to see if there were any who understood, who sought after God. They have all gone aside. They have together become corrupt. There is no one who does good no, not one. Have all the workers of iniquity no knowledge who eat up my people as they eat bread and don't call on Yahweh. This is talking about what we would call a practical atheist. Not necessarily someone who doesn't acknowledge that there's a creator with their mouth or say that they don't believe in a creator. But this fool here is someone who's a practical atheist who shows that they don't believe in a God by the way that they live by the way that they conduct themselves. And I think that there's a lot more of that category of people in the world today than there are of people that just say, I don't think that there's a Creator. 
So what Yeshua is saying back in Matthew chapter 5 is when you in your anger lash out and say, you fool, what you're saying is the person is a worthless unbeliever and they're going to be damned for eternity. And He says if you make that kind of judgment on an individual, you yourself will be brought back to having judgment put upon you. You'll be in danger of the fire of Gehenna if you think that you can make eternal judgments on other individuals. I've gotten into a lot of discussions about the Scriptures over the years. And there have been times when I've heard people say, well, there's just no hope for this particular person. Brothers and sisters, nothing is impossible with Yahweh. Amen. There is always hope. No matter how far a person has gotten off track, or no matter how far a person is off track, there's always hope as long as they can do this and do that. Never stop praying. Never stop fasting for them. Never stop seeking Yahweh for that person. There's always hope. We do not need to go around calling people fool in the sense that we're placing a judgment upon them that there's no hope for you. You're too far gone. You're just an unprofitable, vain piece of nothing. We can't make that kind of judgment. So then we go to Matthew chapter 5, verse 24, or excuse me, verse 23. Now remember, this is on the heels of what he has just said. He mentions the letter of the law. That's not enough to obey. Because then he goes on and says, the sixth commandment's deeper. The spirit of the law is deeper. So then we have a therefore, or a so, in the Scriptures. Meaning, what I'm about to say is telling off of what I just said. Verse 23, If therefore, because of what I've said, you are offering your gift at the altar, um, the immediate context would be they're bringing a sacrifice to Yahweh's altar. Animal sacrifice, sometimes a grain offering, which would be a meatless offering. But they're bringing a sacrifice to the altar. And there, all of a sudden, you are bringing the sacrifice to the altar and you remember that your brother or a person, brother or sister, has anything against you. Leave your gift before the altar and go your way and first be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. What this is teaching us here is that unforgiveness is a violation of the Sixth Commandment. Unforgiveness falls under the heading of do not murder. Why? Because you're bringing harm towards that person. I was reading the other day, and it's a scripture that I've read so much, but it hit me harder than it's ever hit me before. And it's the parable of the unforgiving servant where one man gets forgiven of a whole lot and then he goes and won't forgive another man of a whole little. And he gets in trouble for it. And he says, So it will be for every one of you who does not forgive their brother from their heart. From their heart. I remember. Everybody raised children. And the more children you get, the more spats that happen. And they fuss with one another. And you tell them you need to say sorry. And they say sorry. And you know they don't mean it from their heart. I remember Mama telling me, no, mean it, Matthew, mean it. Sometimes it'd take me days until I would mean it. It would. I'm glad my Mama would teach me like that. You know, you've got to mean it from your heart, Matthew. But when we forgive someone, we must mean it from our heart. And Yeshua is telling us here, if you remember before you bring your gift to the altar, the principle here is before we come to worship, before we come to praise Yahweh, before we come to clap our hands, before we come to shout hallelujahs, if all of a sudden we remember, whoa, whoa, there's an alt there that I need to take care of. He said, lay what you're about to do down at the altar and then go and be reconciled to that person and then come and offer your gift. Yeshua is saying we should not try to present ourselves to Yahweh without having things ironed out in our personal life. We should not come before Yahweh on the new moons or Sabbaths or holy days 
if we are out living like the devil during the six days of the week. Amen? Amen. Yahweh wants our life. The Sabbath day doesn't mean anything to Yahweh if you don't live for Him all of the time. As a matter of fact, He says in Isaiah 1, I hate your Sabbath. It then becomes yours rather than His. If you're offering your gift at the altar, remember that your brother has something against you. Go and be reconciled. The CEV says, So if you are about to place your gift on the altar and remember that someone is angry with you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. Make peace with that person. Then come back and offer your gift to the Almighty. Talking about the spirit of the law. The spirit of the sixth commandment. Don't be a scribe or a Pharisee and cap the sixth commandment off at physical murder. It goes well beyond that. It's much deeper than that. It includes that. Let's not forget the letter. The letter of the law. Notice here Yeshua is not doing away with the letter of the law. The letter of the law, do not murder, still stands. He's just saying, there's more to it, guys. But I say unto you, there's more to it. You don't understand. Yahweh has always taught this, but it's been grayed over. It's been colored over. And I'm teaching you how to understand this properly. Make peace with people. Verse 25, I love it here in the CEV because it falls right on the heels of verse 24. It says, before you're dragged to the court, make friends with the person who has accused you of doing wrong. If you don't, you'll be handed over to the judge and then to the officer who will put you in jail. I promise you that you will not get out until you have paid the last cent that you owe. So what Yeshua is saying here in context is, there are times when you're going to be accused of doing something wrong. There are times when you're going to have spats with people in the world. And if you have that spat, and especially if you are in the wrong, make peace with the adversary that you have at that time before it gets out of hand, before you have to drag, be drugged through the courts, before you have to spend all that money. You won't get out until you pay the last farthing or the last cent, the last penny. Basically, he's just teaching us again. Reconciliation, peace, shalom is what I want for my followers. Sometimes that means we have to be the originator of peace. And that's hard. That's hard because sometimes other people do us wrong. And we don't feel like making peace with them. But, blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are the peacemakers. Go and make peace anyhow. Go and make peace anyhow. And especially if you search yourself in humility and you have done something wrong towards somebody, and absolutely, absolutely you should make peace. We should be a people of peace. This is a good starter on what Yeshua is teaching us here in the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, next week we're going to get into the seventh commandment. Do not commit adultery. And we're going to learn that the seventh commandment also goes well beyond just the letter of the law. And more into the spirit. So I'm going to have a word of prayer and then we'll do our prayer request and testimony service. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for loving us. Thank you for sending your son to live for us, to die for us, and thank you for raising him from the dead on the third day. Yahweh, I ask right now that you would help us to believe these scriptures that we've read today. I pray, Yahweh, that you would fasten them to our minds and our hearts. Father, let us leave the church house today not being forgetful about what we've learned. But this is something we can put to practice every day of our life. Being kind, being gracious, being forgiving, being peaceful. All of those attributes, Yahweh, help them to be in my life. And help them to be in the lives of all of those in this congregation and, and outside of the congregation as well. Yahweh, we do thank you so much for your word. Through your son Yeshua, I pray. Amen.